Gene Expression Project is due this week. Please um, give me a copy in class, but you also need to submit it through Stable Science. So just on Blackboard, because I had a little plagiarism issue last year, and I'm trying to avoid that happening again. So everyone knows it's going through Stable Science, so if you're plagiarizing, it's going to be caught. And then what happens when you plagiarize is I have to say mean things to you. And I don't want to do that. And it's the whole group, and then the group gets pissed off, and whoever is the plagiarizing. So everyone, like, stay on top. And plagiarizing could mean, like, copying one or two sentences, and you don't realize you're copying it, and then, oops, I plagiarized. So just be careful and, and really um, cite everything, and you should be fine. Um, yeah, last year was really sad because it was a group of four people and everyone worked really hard and one person who really didn't work hard at all plagiarized like a whole his whole section from a publication. And I'm like, this clearly <laughs> you're saying you're gonna do experiments. But you yeah, it was really bad. Uh, okay. So there's your warning. So if you can everyone can just um, like get one person to submit. And I have to I have to set up the save of sign thing on Blackboard so I'll let you guys know when it's up. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, by Friday. Okay. Yeah, I know it's unfortunate because those of you who want to stop coming to class, you're going to have to come to class until we end. It's horrible. You can always risk it and just listen to the recording. Why not? Um, okay. So, so far we talked about translation. Um, the mechanism, the importance of binding the correct amino acid for DNA, how that happens, uh, translation initiation, elongation, and termination, not necessarily in that order. And then we started talking about DNA damage. I'm really excited because it looks like we're going to finish DNA damage early. So I'm going to actually get to teach you some very cool things that I haven't had, had the time to teach in the past. And I think it's because we're taking our exams in recitation. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so DNA damage, we talked about many different types of damage. Basically, you can categorize them as removals or additions. Either something's being taken off that should be taken off, like a base, um, or something's being added that should be added. Either it's a bond or a methyl group or something like that. Um, we talked about some basic mechanisms of repair. Uh, reversal, the, and they fall into the two categories of reversal and excision and resynthesis. Um, we briefly mentioned photolysis and methyl transferases as two mechanisms for reversal, and I gave you the example of the system in bacteria with ADA, which, or ADA, ADA, which um, activates expression of itself. Um, in addition to removing methyl groups. Uh, we spoke about NER and DR nucleotide excision repair and base excision repair. Um, and then we spoke about um, how there are also errors that happen from re during replication and that they're repaired by multiple things, but one mechanism is um, post-replication mismatch repair. So that's where we left off. Well, actually, where we left off is starting to talk about double strand breaks. So there's two um, main mechanisms for repairs of double strand breaks. So double strand breaks are bad. It's double strand breaks. They're, they're the worst kind of damage. Well, I think they're the worst kind of damage you can get. What do I know? Um, double strand breaks are caused by ionizing radiation replication errors, like... Um, uh, a lesion that might cause stone replication for um, oxidizing agents and metabolites. And so the two categories for repair can fall into non homologous end joining and homologous recombination. So non homologous end joining is the quick and dirty method for repair. It's 
it is quick and dirty in the sense that there's not much to it. It doesn't use a template at all, and it just brings the ends together and seals them up pretty much. And so as you can imagine, wow. Hi, guys. How's it going? Um, everyone was waiting for that five-minute mark. Anybody? Okay. Okay. Um, it basically grabs up the end, brings them together, and seals them up. And as you can imagine, that results in um, loss of sequence or um, mutation, basically. So some main points to think about when you're thinking of non-homologous end joinings. First of all, it might sometimes show up as NHEJ, non-homologous end joining. Um, and it is what it says it is, non-homologous end joining. Um, Right, so you have a break, and it'll be recognized by these Ku proteins that basically act to break, hold on to the strands, bring them together, and then some other proteins obviously are involved. We're not going to go through a detailed mechanism here. And then you get processing of the ends, and then um, some repair synthesis, but not really, and ligation. So it's basically grab the ends, bring them together, ligate them. So some important points to remember about non-homologous end joining, it requires these Ku proteins. No template is needed, right? Notice you're not repairing anything based off of a template. Uh, results in loss of sequence because there's this trimming that happens um, before ligation. And um, often you'll get some mutation because you're having loss of sequence and then inappropriate rejoining. Um, and this is a fairly common mechanism of repair in um, somatic cells, in mammalian cells. So I thought this was interesting. In the textbook it says, by age 70, typical somatic cells contain more than 2,000 non-homologous end joining scars. Isn't that crazy? And I'm guessing, how do you think that they can identify where non-homologous end joining occurs? So I just told you that there's no template involved in repair, right? So it's just kind of brought together. And then there's some kind of trimming. Some exonuclease comes in and does a little bit of trimming before it's religated. So how do you think you might be able to, if you're sequencing a whole genome, how might you identify? Yes? Okay, so you're saying compare, compare different cells, look for the changes in sequence. Okay, so what would you be seeing? So let's say you look at different sequences from cells that um, are most likely like somatic cells to contain a lot of these non-homologous end joining scars and compare it to stem cells, which you would guess have, you're guessing have a more stringent form of repair. Um, what, do you, what would you see? Let's say you can't compare and you're just sequencing and looking. What would you say? You have a gene, right? But something be different? Maybe? Small deletions. You would see small, right? So you would see small deletions, right? So you'd see either a coding region or a non coding region. Um, these small deletions. And yes, you would have to be comparing it to something um, so you can see deletions, especially if it's not coding. Right? So the reason that we're okay with this really sloppy kind of repair is because most of our genome is not coding. So there's plenty of space for these little mutations to show up, and it's fine. It doesn't affect our proteins, or it just doesn't affect our coding. Okay, um, and um, another fun fact is this form of replication is the source of chromosome translocation. So when you think about um, translocations, that means when a chromosome breaks and it's joined to another part of a chromosome, this is seen in cancer a lot, like BCR able leukemia is one. Um, it's usually this kind of sloppy repairing of broken chromosomes. Any questions? Thoughts? 
Did everyone have a nice weekend? It was a pretty weekend, huh? We went to the flower mart. I'm guessing you guys are big flower mart attenders. <laughs> no, it's not Vernon. No, the in-laws were in town. Let's go to the flower mart. Why not? Okay. Okay, so let's go to another mechanism for double strand break repair. So the first one was non-homologous end joining. The next one is homologous recombination. And you guys have learned about this before when you are, talked about crossing over and meiosis and, and generation of new um, diversity of genome, having babies and whatnot. Um, yeah, so with double strand break repair, you're actually using your sister chromatid as a template. So this is an accurate repair, and there's, so there's no loss of nucleotides. It occurs after replication because you need to have your sister chromatids present. Um, it uses it as a template, and it's used to repair broken replication force. It's used, um, and it's used in a, num a number of other DNA arrangements, including DNA repair. So we'll just go through the basics of homologous recombination. So here's your sister chromatids after replication, and, and you went and you got an x-ray because you broke your arm or something like that. And there's, oops, double sham break. Oops. Should have worn that lead apron. Um, Obviously, you're going to get double strand breaks with their extra angle right now. Okay, so then you have a nuclease that will degrade the five prime ends because you need the three prime overhang. Then you get a, what's called strand invasion. So this three prime strand can invade the sister chromatid and it's base pairing with homologous sequence in the sister chromatid. This is called a branch point, different branch point than in splicing. Um, that's where it crosses over there, and then branch migration where it goes in and starts to base pair with the homologous sequence. Then the DNA is repaired using the template, so now you start to have DNA synthesis. It's using the template from the sister chromatid. So you get this transient four-stranded DNA. Uh, which is called holiday junction, and that needs to be resolved. We won't go through the mechanism, because that always makes me crazy. I love how it's called a holiday junction. You know what it makes me think of? Do you guys, are you guys Muppets fans? Not the Lady Holiday? No? Come on. Wrong generation. You people are too young for me. Okay. Everyone needs to go home and watch the Muppets. Um, which one is it? I think it's just the original Muppet movie. The original, not the one that came out last year. Lady Holiday. Anyways, so you have to resolve the holiday junction, and then you get um, top strand DNA. So resolving holiday junction means making it go back to normal DNA, not this four strand of DNA. And then you have uh, the DNA synthesis of the top strand and ligation, and then you have accurate repair of the DNA. So it's not, you can see how it's a bit more labor intensive than um, not homologous end joining, but it's accurate. Okay, any thoughts, questions before we move on? I feel like there's more people here today. You guys are sad that it's going to be over soon, aren't you? You want to get all your time <coughs> with me. Yes. So this is only occurring in the This, no, this can occur after replication. Yeah, any time after, the question is, does this only recur in, occur at the beginning of meiosis? This can occur whenever you have sister chromatids present. You just need that, that template to go by. Okay, any other questions? So a great question for the exam would be, you know, DNA damage that occurs um, any time outside of that space or any time after mitosis and before completion of that phase. Probably won't use this mechanism, right? So think about that. I'll do. Make a note. Okay. Um, 
So strand invasion, right? So I'm telling you something about strand invasion. That's that's this three, free three prime n coming into the sister chromatids, right? So that's actually catalyzed by REC A or RAM51. So this is it's not just random. And it's funny the way it's taught is like there's just this <coughs> wild DNA strand that just wants to invade. Um, so this is apparently it can happen. It can happen spontaneously, but it does it doesn't happen with any purpose. So you need these proteins, REC A and E. coli, RAD51 and eukaryotes, and they are DNA binding proteins and they catalyze strand invasion. REC A binds to the single strand DNA, it intertwines it, it has multiple binding sites, so it intertwines the single strand DNA from the fleshy, from the damaged DNA with the double strand template DNA on the sister chromatids. And then the, sig si bleh, the single strand DNA searches for homologous sequences, additional proteins help this to happen, and the single strand DNA base pairs with the strand from the double strand DNA so proteins are required to help this happen, and it's ATP dependent. Okay, so that's um, repair of double strand breaks. Okay, so now we're going to move on. In certain cases, um, the damage can't be repaired, or something something's going on. Basically, we can't repair the damage. And we need DNA replication to proceed. And so then we have something called translation DNA synthesis. Because error-prone DNA replication is better than no replication at all, right? If you want your, your, your species to survive, you better divide, right? Other than, rather than just be stalled. Um, so, that requires translation polymerases. So here's your, here's your DNA sequence, and something happens that results in DNA damage, which right here is this X. That's your damaged DNA base. And then during DNA replication, you'll have stalling of a fork, of the replication fork, when it hits that damaged base. And what can happen if it for whatever reason isn't repaired and you need your replication fork to progress, then you'll get recruitment of translesion polymerase, which will allow synthesis. So it'll just add any old basin to allow it to, to progress. And then the, then the replicative DNA polymerase comes back and resumes DNA synthesis. Um, so you can think of translesion polymerases as damage tolerance rather than repair. They clearly are low fidelity, right? I crack myself up. Um, and have poor processivity, right? You don't want your translesion polymerase to be highly processed. You want it to hop on, do what it's got to do and leave and let the rest of the polymerase come back because the translesion polymerase is so poor, it's so, so sloppy that it would just start adding in random bases, it'd be bad news. Yeah? It might be better for these cells just to die, or would we have a... Wouldn't it be better for these cells just to die? Would it only be effective if you're a single cell organism? Would it, okay, so is it only effective if you're a single cell organism? That is, that's a really interesting conversation. Let's think about it. So why would you want to bypass a lesion versus apoptosis, right? Versus induced apoptosis, right? Let's think about it. Who has, who has some thoughts on this? <clears throat> we can talk for a minute. Hey, well, there's a high probability, at least in like the human genome, that this error could be in a non-coding region that's not doing anything. So just going on having it work in the cell, so just fine. If it doesn't mess something up, there's other mechanisms to apoptosis. Okay, so if this damage is in an area where that's non-coding and it doesn't make a difference, maybe you're better off just <coughs> bypassing it versus activating this whole apoptosis pathway. <coughs> yep. I think in theory, like, if you look at the like the area of the polymerase, it's like one of the main things that I just press to slave it's a good idea. But when you factor in, you're really constantly bombarded with this. So 
So you're saying damage happens at such a high rate that you'd be done constantly, perhaps? Yep. I mean, how often are we exposed to super high energy radiation? But that's one type, don't forget. High energy radiation is one source of damage. The sun is another. Meat is meat. This, so this is actually more likely to happen. So double strand breaks is one thing. So this isn't just, so double strand breaks is caused by the ionizing radiation and other things. But also, you can have these like these methyl groups added. You can have just alkyl groups added. You can have thymidine dimers. You can have a whole a whole bunch of other things can happen um, just from surviving, just from being out there living in the world, not living in any particularly toxic environment. So you do, I think, if, I think if every single time damage can re be repaired, um, apoptosis occurred, then I don't know that we'd survive. Um, I think you have to have a certain amount of damage to induce apoptosis. Any other thoughts about this? But it's a really nice thing to think about. Yes? Are there any mechanisms that, let's say, recognize the damage ultimately go to apoptosis? Yep, we're going to actually talk about all the pathways, all the pathways, not all of them, the pathways involved in DNA damage repair. And some of them um, cause cell cycle arrest. Well, they, they can go in many different directions, some causing cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so this enzyme, the translucent polymerases, they have low fidelity, poor processivity, and no exonuclease, 3'5'5' exonuclease activity. That makes sense. That would be wasted. Exonuclease activity would be wasted on this polymerase because it's kind of just putting whatever in. Um, it has a larger, more flexible active site that can accommodate bulky lesions. Yes? So I saw that why we use translucent Why would we use the translucent? So translucent polymerase is only recruited when it's needed. So normally you're using your normal representative DNA polymerase, mm -hmm. and then as the polymerase encounters a lesion of some sort, some kind of bulky adduct added on, right, to the to a base, let's say, then it's going to stall, and then you're going to have modification of, I think, the sliding clamp and recruitment of translation polymerase just for a second, just to add in the space, so and then it's going to go away and the replicative polymerase will resume. So can we use on the combination of Yes, right. So we don't want it. So that's why we're using the normal DNA polymerase to, to replicate our chromosome mm -hmm. and only recruiting this one when we need it. For, to remove, usually to deal with one base or a small stretch. Okay? Okay. So this is how, if you look at, uh oh, I'm boring people today. Okay. Um, if you look at the polymerases, their active sites are more open than those of rep replicative polymerases. So you can see here's your replicative polymerases over here. This is just two different um, orientations. And you can see this very large space for um, the active site versus the smaller space. And remember, fitting in the active site has something to do with the specificity also. But also, it needs to accommodate these large lesions. Uh, these are large bulky lesions that might occur um, with DNA damage. Yeah? So the reason the translation polymerase is recruited to use DNA polymerase would have stalled if it hit them? Right. DNA polymerase stalls when it hits a lesion. Then translation polymerase is recruited. You bypass the lesion, and then it leaves, and your normal replicative DNA polymerase resumes. Yeah. Um, Yes. Okay, so the DNA damage response recruits translesion synthesis polymerase to the sliding clamp. 
So obviously you want this to be tightly regulated. Yes. Is the damage repaired like later on or is it just left? Is the damage repaired later on or is it left? I guess, I mean, it's, it's still there, right? So I guess it's possible that it could attempt to be repaired later on. That's a really good question. I'm sure it must be. I'm sure. Why not, right? Huh? Then it's a mismatch. So it's a mismatch. So you end up with a mutation, right? So you've got you've got um, replication happening, and you have damage, and you have random base added, right? And so oh, and on the next round of replication, you end up with a mutation on one side, and then the other side has has the damaged base still. So my guess is there's a whole cell cycle there for an attempt, a repair attempt to occur, right? Why not? Um, so you have recruitment of translation polymerase to the sliding clamp, and this is tightly regulated, obviously, because you don't want such a sloppy, error-prone polymerase to randomly be coming and participating in the synthesis, right? And then also, don't forget, it's not very, it's, it, its processivity is very low, so it's not going to associate with the DNA for very long anyway. So how does this happen? Um, huh. Maybe I have that later. Okay, we'll get back to that, but I, it's, it ha, it's involved with ubiquitination. Um, we'll get back to it. So keep this in your mind. How is translation synthesis recruited to, to the plant? How is that regulated? Okay. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the DNA damage response. So this is only induced by ex extensive damage or damage that interferes with replication. And the purpose is to recruit repair proteins, then amplify the response, and halt the cell cycle so repair can happen. So one thing that happens with DNA damage is it results in stalled or cleft replication ports, right? If you have a lesion here, then as, as um, replication occurs, you get stalling because the polymerase stalls right there, doesn't know what to do, and you get this single-stranded DNA. Or if you have a single-strand NIC, that could result, as your replication fork progresses, it can result in a, a double-strand break because, um, well, that's going to be double-stranded. And that results in collapse of the replication fork. So stall replication forks result in stretches of single strand DNA or collapse of the replication fork, and that's going to activate the DNA damage response. So think back to when we talked about telomeres. You can imagine that telomeres, if not correctly bound by proteins and in the right conformation, could also <coughs> activate the DNA damage response, and that's why you have those telomere binding proteins, and you have that looping around because you have this single strand DNA. It kind of looks, the telomere actually looks a lot like that, doesn't it? Right? Okay, so in multicellular organisms, unrepaired DNA damage can trigger, can trigger apoptosis. So let's talk about one mechanism of DNA damage in bacteria called the SOS response. And it not only, well, it activates expression of DNA damage repair genes by recognizing single, by recognizing single stranded DNA at solid replication ports. So normally, you'll have your replication happening, right? You're leading in your lagging strand. And then you've got this RecA protein. And remember, we just talked about RecA. So it's involved in a few different things. So when a replication fork stalls, okay, well, before I say that, you've got Rec A, it's not active, it's just hanging out. And then you've got gene expression happening over here. Well, not really. So you've got your SOS genes and you've got this Lex A repressor bound. Okay, so that SOS genes are off, everything is normal, everything is fine. And when you get activation of your SOS response, it results in, in inducing about 40, more than 40 genes, including 
the UVR proteins, transfusion polymerase, a whole bunch of repair proteins are induced by the SOS response. So if you have a stalled replication fork, rec, rec A is going to recognize and bind to single strand DNA, and then it will cleave the Lex A repressor. So it can't repress anymore. And so it's, it can't bind to DNA, and you've got activation of gene expression of all these DNA repair proteins. Yes? So if active binds to single strand of DNA, single strand of so, okay, so you're saying single-strand binding proteins, aren't they covering uh, the single-strand in DNA? Um, I think, you know, you bring up a real, that is a really good point, right? Because single-strand binding, single binding proteins coat all that single-strand DNA. I think, let's think about it for a minute. This is in bacteria, but I think in bacteria that's happening too. I mean, are they unstable? The same strain of bunch of so long. You know what? So I feel like I heard, I, I had to, I feel like this question came up last year, the same exact question. And it does have something to do with excessive amounts of time of single strand binding protein hanging out on the DNA, and that, that will trigger. The a DNA damage response, um, but you're right. I mean, how can it bind to DNA if single strand binding proteins are there? That's a really good question. But hmm, hmm, you've stopped the teacher. Let's think about this. Okay, so I will try to get back to you about this. But I encourage anyone who's trying to get points uh, to let me know in the next 24 hours if single strand binding proteins are binding to single strand DNA during replication, how is Rec A binding? <coughs> Let me know in the next 24 hours and if you're right, I'll have to look in my notes from last year. I totally remember this coming up. Good question. Um, okay, so in the magical world we know why this happened and Rec A binds to single strand DNA and cleaves Lex A, and that results in expression of these SOS genes. And then once the DNA damage is repaired, well, one of the, S one of the SOS genes that is, um, that is expressed is this DIN1 protein and Lex A, and DIN1 will actually bind to Rec A and prevent it from binding to the DNA, and then new Lex A will be synthesized also and bind to and repress gene expression. So turn off synthesis of the SOS genes. So basically, you get activation of SOS genes by single strand DNA at stalled replication forks. Okay. Any questions about this? No? Everyone's happy? I see some people who look like they're just here because they need to be here. You guys don't need to come. I mean, you should. You should. I see, like, a lot of... <laughs> it's been rough. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. Why not? Why not? Okay. So DNA damage is repaired, Rec A binds to this DIN1 protein, right? So I, I just said that, remember? Rec A binds to DIN1, that's inhibitor prevention from binding to single strand DNA. Let's think, let's, let's, oh, we're gonna go back to your question in a minute. Um, DIN1 is a DNA mimic, it looks, its structure looks like DNA, it has a number of neg negatively charged amino acids and, and that on alpha helix, and it's supposed to look um, at the molecular level like DNA and binds to Rec A and inhibits it. I'm thinking, I'm still thinking about your question, it's bugging me, because I'm wondering if DIN1 has anything to do with that. Yes? Yes. 
Where is it? The let's say repressor is bound to the DNA world. It's going to find somewhere the promoter of that so I change. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the. So don't ask me how these come in contact. Uh, that's yeah. 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 So yeah. So the so the obvious question that is begged from this mechanism is how if Rec A is bound to single strand DNA, how is it cleaving the let's say repressor? Um, I'm guessing what it must there must be let's say repressor in solution and that's being cleaved and there must be a, a relatively short half life to the one that's bound. That's my guess. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Okay. So DNA damage response. So in eukaryotic cells, you can think of the DNA damage response as basically a way to recruit repair proteins to the damage, okay? If you've got damage, how is it gonna be fixed if you can't get the repair proteins to the right place? And so you've got proteins that are gonna sense the single-stranded, double-stranded breaks, and they're gonna bind, and they're gonna recruit kinases that are gonna signal the presence of damage, and those kinases are gonna phosphorylate and activate other proteins and then that phosphorylation creates binding sites for repair proteins. So you get this assembly of these complexes called foci at the DNA damage sites. And then you also get recruitment of cell cycle of checkpoint proteins to halt the cell cycle. Okay. So um, you get phosphorylation of all these mediators and effectors that result in apoptosis, transcriptional regulation, cell cycle control, um, and DNA repair. How is everyone doing? I got a thumbs up. Another thumbs up. Good. Okay. So RPA. An MRN, RPA is one protein, oops, um, an MRN is a complex of protein, MRE11, RAD50, NS, MBS1. They are sensors, which means that they will directly bind to the damage. So RPA will bind to single-stranded DNA and detect DNA damage there. <coughs> Single strand DNA that should be single stranded. I think I'm really stuck on your question. Here. I'm thinking that the single strand DNA that occurs during replication is really transient, right? And single strand DNA that is there because of a collapse of replication for an error of some sort of damage is going to be there for much longer time, right? Yeah, it's got to be a timing thing, but there's obviously going to be regulation. Okay, so RPA binds to single-stranded DNA, so this is a sensor, and it recruits a kinase called ATR, which, um, to the damage, and then you're going to get activation of downstream events. With double-strand breaks, you're also going to have detection of the DNA damage by this MRN complex, right? How can you do repair DNA damage if you can't find it? if you don't know where it is, right? So always you're gonna have assembly of protein complexes at the site of damage. Um, you're gonna get MRN complex recruited to the site of the double strand break, and then re recruitment of, of ATM, which is another kinase. And that's gonna activate downstream repair pathways. So you have binding of R <coughs> RPA, so single-stranded DNA, and then you get activation of ATR and all of these other proteins that result in activation of ATR, and then that results in cell cycle control um, through phospho, basically a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of repair pathways. Um, you get you get cell cycle arrest. You have to stabilize, stabilize your replication fork, and um, you're going to phosphorylation of RPA, MCM. Remember, MCM with S phase activation. So there's another way to halt the cell cycle. Um, okay. Ah. So binding of RPA 
has single strand DNA at the replication fork, recruits this trans lesion synthesis polymerase. So you normally have PCNA, which is the sliding plant that helps uh, polymerase, the replicative polymerase to be processive. And when RPA binds, it recruits RAD6 and RAD18, which are ubiquitination complex. And then it results in ubiquitination of PCNA and recruitment of the translucent synthesis polymerase. So you've got sensing, sensing of your single strand DNA. You have recruitment of ubiquitin ligase that ubiquitinates the clamp and recruits the translucent synthesis polymerase. I thought that was like five slides ago. Okay. Okay, I want to stop here, um, and we will continue with this on Wednesday. Yes. Okay, guys, so I'm getting a question about recitation for this week. What do I require? Please bring your, please bring your, um, your proposal, at least one copy for me, because that's where I graded you all to submit it through safe sign. Um, and bring your presentation in some format. I'm going to go fool around with the computer next. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'm wondering if we could uh, start out the presentations. Um,